Welcome to this year's convention. I'm Ridley Scott. I've just completed production on my latest picture since Alien. Blade Runner, starring Harrison Ford as the classic hardball detective, is based on Philip Dick's novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? We've prepared a special short film for you on the making of the picture, including the wizardry of Douglas Trumbull and the imaginative industrial designs of Sid Mead that helped us create this view of tomorrow. Blade Runner is very simply a thriller um, set in, has to be set in a slightly future terms, 40 years time, 40 or 50 years time, uh, really for the nature, the credibility of the, of the plot. We chose to um, make the texture of the, of the theme and the story, uh, because it had to be set in the future, to try and make it as familiar as possible. We try to make the character in a kind of Philip Marlowe environment. So whilst we're looking 40 years in the future, it's very familiar in many respects and almost seems, seems like 40 years ago. Daphne, I want to ask you a few questions. Yeah. You ever see that girl before? Never saw her. How about this guy, transvestite, maybe? You think I'm a pervert? Get out of here. You ever buy snakes from the Egyptian pattern? Sure, all the time. Licenses in order, pal. The uh, first ideas came after several meetings with uh, Ridley and the art director and people that were responsible for estimating costs and the overall idea to start with was a society where technology life had become very difficult and the mechanical uh, fixtures automobiles trucks uh, buildings the whole urban plant had become a uh, like a trap for people in the society as i started off with very clean designed concepts and then successively layered on top of those initial ideas sort of a accumulation of detail and uh, repairs and extra pieces of equipment that weren't the original equipment idea and achieved this accumulated uh, fix it because it won't run or has to run uh, visual flavor which is the whole essence of the film so it isn't a new, shiny, futuristic society. It's a society where the normal supplies have uh, broken down. The street level particularly had become like the sewers or the underside of the city. And being trapped on the street was uh, not only just unromantic, but, but a, a thoroughly nasty way to spend your life because the street was simply a service access to the mega structures and the uh, high rises that now comprise the city. And decent people really didn't live below 40 stories above the street. So then you start to get this accretion or an accumulation of detail, which are generators, uh, vent pipes, uh, uh, a whole leftover kind of society that you're forced to live with because that's all there is. You can't, you can't afford to go up. And it takes a trend that is happening in some of the larger urban centers and accelerates it and caricatures it, makes it more brutal and more glamorous at each end of the scale. 
than it, than it is now. This parking meter is a kind of miniature example of the whole visual concept of accumulation. You start with a recognizable parking meter inside all this stuff, and it's, it's there. That's the reason for adding on to it in the first place, for economy. Uh, when you no longer can accept coins or, or metal disks or whatever, you add a electronic register that accepts a magnetic card. Uh, the post mechanical case becomes electrified so that if you touch it or try to attack it, uh, you're electrocuted, which is a, a very brutal attack on, on your, you as a human. And uh, by adding additional lights, larger scale, it's easier to see at night. It can be used for directing traffic down lanes, or maybe the lights change color, something like that. We've established the If you do it properly, they don't take great leaps and bounds. I mean, unless you're into truly into sort of fantasy terms like Flash Gordon or whatever you're doing. But if you're taking a step forward in terms of uh, reality, which I'm trying to keep it as real as possible, even though it's very, let's say, rich and exotic and colorful, um, the step forward is small. Like if you take a car, one of the cars we've designed, the original cars we started off with were incredibly sort of sleek and streamlined. And even throwing all the dirt on them and, and uh, rubbish on them under the sun, it still looked slightly futuristic, in inverted commas. And so we sort of back down in the design concept. So they're quite familiar looking cars, except they're just a little exotic. So our step forward is, is small, but it's big, if you know what I mean. The, uh, the start off concept was that the society had produced vehicles that could fly. Uh, we had a specialized vehicle, which only authorized people could use. That's the spinner. It had to look different to make it believable that it could fly, first of all. And so the configuration of that vehicle is totally different than any of the other vehicles because it, it does a particular thing. It actually flies, lifts off the ground, lots of dust. This is the uh, interior spinner set. Uh, when we shoot the exterior of the spinner, none of this interior exists. Uh, this is strictly a set constructed for interior shooting of all of the readouts and all the detail on the exterior vehicles that you'll see driving around in the streets. None of this detail of interior is here. And one of the problems we have today is that on screens like this where there will be readouts of movies, digital displays, uh, maps, etc., for, for maneuvering the vehicle, uh, it was just impossible because of the design of the vehicle to put in rear projection or live video screens or have one, two, three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, 12 or 13 screens of information going on simultaneously. So what we've done is we've just lit these screens with white light from inside, and the camera will be shooting over these actors' shoulders here, and the shot will be what we call locked off. It's a static shot, uh, and we're going to have wind effects and rain effects on the canopy of the vehicle from outside, lighting from outside and a lot of practical lighting from inside. And then what we do in post-production is superimpose into these screens a lot of little movies of the readouts, which will be made later. Outside the window, we'll pull mat lines off the edges of the window here and all around the side doors, and then okay. superimpose the city outside, trying to keep a balance between the natural light on the window, the rain on the window, and the city outside the window. So it's a pretty complicated, this is one of the most complicated composite mats in the picture, because even the city outside will be a number of elements. It'll be the city, Foreground miniatures, which are one inch to the foot scale. It'll be half inch to the foot scale miniatures beyond that. Quarter inch to the foot scale miniatures beyond that. A painted backing beyond that. And then between you and it, maybe six or eight other spinners all maneuvering that are all optically superimposed together. So the plate that'll, that'll be out the window here alone will probably consist of maybe a dozen film elements all composited together. One of the most fortunate things for us on this picture is that Ridley is quite a good illustrator and does all his own drawings. So we can sit there in a meeting and he can draw for you right before your very eyes what he wants to see. And from that, we can extrapolate what's special effects, what's foreground, what's background, and he can guess at the length of a shot or the angle of a lens and uh, 
we all sort of talk that technical language. And then from that, we make a plan of what the shot will consist of. And then that plan has to do with the fact that we have to construct a set like this, separate from the exterior uh, spinners, when it will be shot and how that relates to when the effects will be shot. When we set out to do this film, uh, we decided to make there was a taboo word. But I may as well use the taboo word because it's, uh, it's somehow, uh, the word was android. And I said, uh, anybody who uses the word android gets their head broken with a baseball bat, OK? Because it sets up all sorts of um, preconceptions of the kind of film it could be, right? And yet the word android, in a way, is, is really a man-made development on, let's say, robots. A robot, by a mechanoid, android, an android may actually be human. I mean, may actually be flesh and blood, genetically structured, okay? So we simply decided to not use the word because it's been overused and misused. And so we developed our own word, which is the word replicant, um, which is essentially a human being. That's the odd dichotomy of the whole story, of the fact the detective job is to is in one sense a kind of policer but also an exterminator if necessary not a bounty hunter he's a bureaucrat he's paid to do the job and along the his path of hunting of replicants who happen to find their way into the city where they have no right to be because the replicants are originally developed for off-world situations both military industrial mining uh, their kind of second-class generation developed for um, uh, inhospitable environments, dangerous work, boring work. There will come a point maybe where if you're going to send an astronaut off into deep space where he'll never come back, and he knows he'll never come back, you may want to send a replicant instead. It's a kind of tongue-in-cheek idea of what could actually happen if industry becomes so large a conglomerate became so large that let's say it said developed into aerospace, let's say it developed into space probes looking for mining and another side to that company could be genetics and genetic engineering. So the associations with genetic and genetic engineering could quite easily be the development of the first human, which is right on the doorstep right now. That's a look at what we've been up to for the last year. It was a very exciting project for us and we hope you will like Blade Runner. Enjoy the convention. <laughs>